Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Phil Richards. In today's video we're going to be talking about testing active range of motion of the ankle joint. We're going to be taking you through the key movements you need to do and the key muscles involved in those actions. If you're not familiar with why we test active range of motion, we suggest you check out our video titled Why We Test Active Range of Motion for the full clinical reasoning process behind why we do what we do. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the affected and unaffected sides, but of course in practice we always want you to compare the two so you can see if there's any key differences between one side and the other. So when we're thinking about active range of motion testing, we need to consider three things. P, Q and R. That stands for pain, quality and range. If you're familiar with our P, Q and R, then you can head straight over to the next video and we'll see you there. If you're not familiar with P, Q and R, here's the recap. So as we have said, when testing active range of movement of any joint, we need to consider P, Q and R. P for pain, Q for quality of movement, and R for range of movement. In terms of pain, if pain is present, we know that there is a dysfunction within this movement, which may be causing our patient's problem, and will likely direct further testing to this area to try and isolate the source of the pain. If pain is not elicited as part of the examination, the therapist can move on to the next stage. For example, if there is no pain on active lumbar spine movements during a hip examination, the lumbar spine can be ruled out of the initial investigation. In terms of quality, good quality indicates that the brain and local tissue are both happy and able to perform the movement. So what does that look like? It means that the patient will look very willing to move and have sufficient power in movement with good control and coordination. If these are lacking during the movement, quality can be questioned, and thus likely would direct further testing to establish why the movement is of poor quality. For example, weakness, which could be due to a myotomal weakness from a spinal pathology, or a deconditioned muscle from the local area. In terms of range of movement, too much or too little range can indicate a dysfunction within the movement, and could also help us identify the patient's condition. As a therapist, it is always important to use the range values within your movement test as objective markers and for you to compare the specific range values in each treatment session. It is important to note the range at which your patient's pain starts and the range at which the movement ends, as often these two values will be very different. For example, if we only measured the movement at which pain starts, we do not actually know how much range the patient can achieve. Essentially, a lack of range indicates that there is a stiffness or a weakness which is preventing full movement. So now we're going to look at active range of motion of the ankle into dorsiflexion. As a therapist, we're going to stand the side and bottom of the bed looking at the ankle and the patient is going to be in long sitting comfortable. From here, we ask the patient to pull their toes and their ankle up towards them. And from here, we're going to add on our overpressure. We're gonna cut the calcaneus and let our forearm rest. We're gonna block the knee from flexing, but at the tibia, the proximal part, so we're not actually compressing the patella, the kneecap. From here, we're gonna use our body weight and just add that extra bit of pressure. The chief muscles that are involved in this active dorsiflexion are extensor digitorum, extensor hallucis longus, and tibialis anterior. So let's look at P, Q, and R, pain, quality, and range. In active dorsiflexion, common sites of pain are in the extensor compartment, from the muscles overworking too hard, sometimes in the tibia itself from periosteal irritation from muscles pulling on the bone, uh, the subtalar joint if we have the presence of osteoarthritis or a very jammed joint, and sometimes if they have a particularly bad Achilles tendonitis then that will be irritated from it being passively stretched. In terms of quality we'd normally see a very smooth action coming up However, two common sheets to look out for are one is extending the knee to perform the movement and the other is actually bending the knee to try and generate power. So if you see either of those things, you might want to just uh, prompt the patient to not perform those actions to see if the muscle is actually working well or whether it needs to be paired with something else because it's too weak. In terms of range, from this position, we're expecting around 20 degrees dorsiflexion and this can indicate, if it's less than that, that they have a tight calf. Something that's really useful to also look out for is if we can bend Marie's knee up to here, is the range of available ankle dorsiflexion from here, now that we've slackened off the gastrocnemius, 
we can see if the joint is able to achieve the range or whether it's been restricted by the soft tissue. So now we're going to look at active range of motion at the ankle into plantar flexion. So as a therapist, we're gonna stand looking directly at the ankle by the side of the bed, and the patient is going to be lying comfortably in a sort of long sitting position. From here, we simply just ask the patient to point their foot as far down as they can. And then from there, we can add some overpressure. The easiest way to do this is to cut the calcaneus, the heel bone, and grab on top of the foot and just apply a slight bit of overpressure from there. The chief muscles that are involved in the plantar flexion of the ankle are the calf, which is sometimes called the triceps suri, which is made up of the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and a smaller muscle called plantaris. Other muscles that are involved in plantar flexing the ankle are lots of the ones that run down the medial malleolus aspect here. So that would cover tibialis posterior and flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. On top of that, we've also got on the lateral aspect of the foot, running down here, the peronei group, which will also plantar flex the ankle. So let's look at our PQ and R, so pain, quality, and range. So common areas of pain in active range of motion for plantar flexion of the ankle include the calf, spanning anywhere from the Achilles of the posterior aspect, inside the medial malleolus, and if we can bring Marie's leg down, and the lateral malleolus. So let's explore those for a second. Because we're actively contracting muscles, we know we've talked about which muscles are involved, so they're commonly having lesions in these areas, so it makes sense that you were gonna get pain in the areas where the muscles are actually contracting. For interest, the reason that we get a lot of pain around here is for twofold reasons. One, the muscle has to suddenly, or the tendon, has to suddenly change angle, which places a great deal of stress on it. And two, this is right near where the subtalar joint is, and it's very susceptible to impingement on the muscles and tendons and the joint itself. Let's look at quality. Normally a calf, uh, well, a plantar flexion action of the ankle works extremely well. If you do see a poor quality, it will normally be very shaky or slow, and will either be due to a, a muscle lesion a pain inhibition, or perhaps something spinal, which you might need to look at later in our other videos. Range. If we start from the ankle being in a plantar grade position, i.e. naught degrees, we can expect around 50 degrees of plantar flexion. With Marie, if you can plantar flex more, this would be excess movement. So now we're going to look at active range of motion of the ankle into inversion. As a therapist, we would normally stand at the end of the bed so we can see the movement of the ankle. But for your video, I'm going to stand here so you can see what the ankle's actually doing. The client, the patient, is going to be in long sitting, comfortable. And the easiest way to ask them to perform inversion is to lightly support the leg and ask them to bring their big toe over to touch your fingers. And that way you won't have to try and explain to them what inversion actually is. So when performing inversion, we also have to add our overpressure. And what you want to do is get one hand, cup under the calcaneus, get your hand like so, like a Pac-Man, put it on top of the tarsals and just gently add your overpressure evenly with your heel and your other hand. The chief muscles that are involved in inversion are your tibialis posterior and your tibialis anterior. So let's move on to P, Q, and R. For pain, we are often going to see pain with the active contractile elements, so pain is quite common around the medial malleolus. So let's review our P, Q, and R. So pain, quality, and range. For active inversion, the common sites of pain are around the medial malleolus from the tibialis posterior activation not so much for the tibialis anterior, although it is an inverter. It, clinically, it's not a common place to get pain around here from doing that. But something to definitely pay attention to is the passive stretch we're gonna get on the lateral structures of the foot. So pain may be created in and around here. If we actually just bring Marie's 
leg down here, if we bend that one up and we pull the foot in here, hopefully you can see that all around this aspect has been stretched. So we're looking at ligaments, ATFL, we've got superficial and deep perineal nerves running through here, and we've got the perinei group, which can all be passively stretched and therefore irritated with pain localized to those areas. Q, in terms of quality, there's two main things to really look out for. One is how they're doing it at the ankle, and the other is how they're doing it at the hip. So if we focus on the ankle to start with, what we want to see is when they perform the movement is are they doing it with relatively excessive dorsiflexion or excessive plantar flexion? If you notice that, it might be good to cue your patient to do it in a mid-range and just see if that actually changes the outcome or not. If it does, you might think that you might need to retrain the muscle in a higher or lower range. Second thing, looking at the hip, it's very common for people to want to roll their hip into internal rotation when performing the movement. Obviously this won't give you an accurate uh, active range of motion at the ankle and we also won't guarantee that they're contracting the necessary structures to perform the movement. So again, just cue your patient to not roll their leg in or you could just gently touch here and say don't move, don't roll from here so they can do that. In terms of range, we're expecting around 40 degrees. Clinically, you'll find that a lot of clinicians will write in terms of a fraction, whether they can achieve a quarter or a half or three quarters range of motion, because it can be very difficult to subdivide the rear, mid and forefoot in terms of inversion. So whilst we want you to know that it's 40 degrees is the normal amount, just bear in mind that clinically that's often what we'd like to do. And with experience and understanding how ankles move, you'll get a good idea of what's normal and not normal. So now we're going to look at active range of motion, eversion at the ankle. As a therapist, we'd normally stand at the end of the bed so we can see what's happening. But for your video at home so you can see what's actually happening at the ankle, I'm going to stand here. The patient, the client, is going to be in long sitting. And as we did with inversion, the best way to perform this as a pure movement into eversion is to just gently block the patient's shin bone and ask them to bring their little toe over to touch your finger. That way you can ensure that they perform an eversion movement. From here, we're gonna add our overpressure. So the way we do that is we're going to cup our hand under the heel bone, the calcaneus. We're gonna get the Pac-Man grip. We're gonna come over the top around the tarsals and then we're just going to increase that slight stretch at the end to perform the overpressure. The chief muscles that are involved in this action are the perinei group, so that's peroneus, brevis, tertius, and longus. And we're gonna move on now to our P, Q, and R. So let's consider P for pain. Common sites of pain are from the active contractile muscles of the perinei group. So you'll be looking for common sites of pain in and around here. Passively, we're going to be stretching inside here so if we can get Marie to bring this leg down you'll be getting a passive stretch here although because the movement of eversion which we're going to talk about in a second is around 20 degrees it's not much movement so you don't get a really big passive stretch here so it's likely that you're only going to get pain here if they have a very irritable lesion let's talk about quality so if we pop that leg up bring that one back down when they're performing this movement you might find it's quite sluggish if the perinei group aren't functioning well. I would say a bigger clue to look for clinically is an ineptness to actually complete the movement, i.e. the patient doesn't really understand how to do the movement. You have to keep cueing them. It's a very good indication their brain doesn't actually understand how to do the movement and therefore it will be, need to be retrained. Another big clue is at the hip. And what they will want to do is roll their hip out to try and perform the movement. So again, similar to other movements we've talked about, you can either actually block at the, the tibia so they can't do it or just cue them and say, but how far can you do it without rolling this leg out like so? And again, if they struggle with it, you might know that, um, struggle to perform the eversion, sorry, because they're rolling their leg out, you might know that that needs to be retrained in isolation. And in terms of the range, as I mentioned before, we're expecting around 20 degrees. And what we mentioned with inversion as well is clinicians will often use fractions again to measure their eversion. 
So commonly a quarters, halves, three quarters, two thirds, that kind of thing. So feel free to use that in your documentation too. Active range of motion ankle summary. Start your active range of motion assessment by clearing the knee. Then complete your assessment of active range of motion of the patient's ankle by looking at active plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, and eversion. Make yourself familiar with the different patient and therapist positions, the method of applying overpressure, as well as the muscles involved in the movement. When looking at active range of motion, look for P, Q, and R. Pain, quality, and range. And that concludes our video on testing active range of motion of the ankle joint. From here, we'd like you to go on to test passive range of motion of the ankle joint. By comparing the two, you can see if it's more likely that a contractile or a non-contractile lesion is responsible for your patient's condition. This alongside your other tests will inform the patient diagnosis. If you're not familiar with why we test active range of motion or passive range of motion, we suggest you check out our videos titled, Why Test Active Range of Motion? and why test passive range motion. Thanks so much for watching guys. We'll see you again soon on Clinical Physio.